Good morning, everyone. Uh, so we have the pleasure uh, to have uh, Professor Ronald Mundu uh, with us today. Uh, and he's going to talk about uh, asymmetry in uh, multi-core architectures. Uh, he's an early career professor in uh, Carnegie Mellon University. His interests are uh, computer architecture in general, and in particular, the interaction between operating system uh, runtimes, uh, compilers, and, and architecture, uh, and in memory systems uh, in particular. Uh, he got his uh, master and uh, PhD uh, from UT uh, Austin, and uh, his undergraduate is uh, from uh, Michigan Ann Arbor um, in computer engineering and, and psychology. So that's uh, that's important in our area. In case there is any psychotic behavior, he's well equipped <laughs> to detect this. So, um, he has uh, worked in the past in Microsoft, in uh, Intel, and AMD. And uh, he has uh, best paper awards in uh, ICCD, ASPLOS, and uh, VTS. So, I mean, but you all know him, so it's not necessary for me to ramble on anymore. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Osman. I I'm not sure if I can actually detect psychotic behavior. I can certainly not correct it, but <laughs> detection is a tough problem in itself, also. That's but we're not going to talk about error correction and detection today. That could be a different talk, maybe. Maybe. Uh, Friday. I'm giving another talk on Friday. That'll be on memory systems. So it's a pleasure to be here uh, in a full room. Uh, and I think we have two hours. Is that correct? Okay. And I can intend. I can lecture for two hours, so you'll have to interrupt me with questions so that you don't need to listen to me rambling. <laughs> okay. I'm going to talk about architecting and exploiting asymmetry in multi-core architectures. This is an area that we have been working on collaboratively with many people. Uh, for a few years now. But before that, let me give you a brief overview. I'll be here until uh, next Monday. Uh, I think I'm leaving very early Monday, so I'm happy to talk with anyone who's interested. So I, I work on a lot of different things in computer architecture, uh, and I'm open to, uh, to talking and discussing collaborations. Today, I'll talk about heterogeneous systems and exploiting bottlenecks. And I think this is a very interesting direction going forward. And I'll give you, I, I'll give you a first uh, briefly why I think it's an important direction going forward. Uh, Friday I'll talk about memory systems. I think this will be an even longer uh, uh, talk. Osman wants me to work hard, so <laughs> he said I should talk for three, three four hours, I think. That, so if you, if you have the stamina to stay for three, four hours, I'll be there, or longer. Uh, but I'll not cover that. I, predictable performance and quality of service, that's another area we work on quite a bit. Uh, and I'm happy to talk about, I think there are quite, quite a few people who are working on this here, especially from a real-time perspective, I'd be happy to exchange ideas. Efficient interconnects, uh, that's, that's a very important area to build a scalable system. Bioinformatics also, I'm very interested in bioinformatics. Uh, we look into DNA sequence alignment and assembly and how to design algorithms and architectures to make that much faster and much more efficient going forward. And other important applications are very interesting also. But today we'll talk about heterogeneous systems and accelerating bottlenecks. So hopefully it'll be interesting. But to keep it interesting, please ask questions. So there are three key problems that I see going forward into the future. And this is my own opinion. Uh, you may have your own problem that's also a key problem. And you can probably put it underneath one of these, in my opinion. What is the memory system that we will talk about on, uh, 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 on Friday? And if, if the, the problem is many important applications uh, are going to be memory bound in the future. And today, they're memory bound also. They're increasingly data intensive, which means that they require a lot of bandwidth as well as capacity at the same time. And we'll cover this in a lot more detail uh, on, Monday, uh, on, uh, on Friday. And data storage and movement limits performance and efficiency. And we'll tackle this problem. We'll see it actually today a little bit also when we try to accelerate bottlenecks. Some, some of the data movements will become a problem. And we'll gain a lot of benefit because we're going to limit the shared data movement by putting accelerating bottlenecks in one particular place. And we're going to move the compute to the data instead of moving the data around. So this is a problem uh, that is going to be increasingly important. But we'll talk a lot more about this on Friday. Efficiency in terms of both per performance and energy limits scalability. And uh, if we want to build more scalable systems, we'd like to make everything, and this is true for everything, we'd like to make everything efficient. Because that enables scalable systems, and that also actually enables better user experience. So today's talk will be mainly about the efficiency aspects. How do we enable a much more scalable system by making it more performance and energy efficient? And predictability and robustness, many of you are working on this. 
uh, this uh, predictability and robustness problems arise because of resource sharing as well as unreliable hardware. And if you put them together, unreliable hardware and shared resources across many different applications, you get even worse problems. Uh, so this caused a lot of quality of service issues. I see all of these as quality of service issues, faults, uh, as well as uh, unpredictable sharing, unfair sharing of resources. And I think these are class <laughs> constraints going forward into the future as we put many more applications sharing the resources that we have so that we can enable much more efficient systems. And the big shared resources, the memory system, certainly. So that ties all of these together, I think. But today we'll talk about efficiency, but I'm happy to talk about any of these uh, going forward. So you might actually wonder what this is about. I'm actually experimenting in my uh, class going forward in a new model. We'd like to make most of the lectures online, but have discussions offline. So this, will, this may be used uh, in, uh, in my class uh, in, uh, in, in, in the fall semester as one of the lectures. So if you ask questions, you'll be <laughs> you'll perhaps be part of the class. I hope you ha I have your consent on that. <laughs> but basically, uh, I'd like to give you some pointers. If you're actually interested in more detail about this talk, I have all of these slides online, and I'll give these slides to Osman so that he can distribute. These are the lectures I have given at Bozici University in Istanbul. Uh, at the uh, beginning of June, and I'll just flash these uh, so that you'll have actually uh, all of the uh, slides. I like, I'm, I'm for making everything public, so hopefully it'll be, uh, it'll be useful for you. These are the papers I'm going to cover. Uh, a lot of the work that uh, I'm going to describe is done collaboratively with uh, Yale Pat students. You probably know him well here. Uh, Alter Suleiman, uh, Jose Joao, and some of the work is Yungu Kim, which is not here actually, but well, if you'll get to it, that's, he, he was my student. And there's some videos. Actually, I believe this talk is a shortened version of this talk is uh, online. So if you, if you sleep through this, you can find it online. So you won't miss much, hopefully. <laughs> and you can actually find uh, other things also. I'd be very interested in your opinion. Uh, I put all my lectures online so that uh, we can experiment with this new educational model where people can learn online. So if you actually get a chance to watch any of these, you don't have to. Uh, and if you have any feedback, feel free to send me an email. I get random emails from the world that <laughs> say you suck or you do very well. But <laughs> I'm happy to receive both and so that we can uh, calibrate. <laughs> okay, uh, I assume there are no questions so far, so I'll jump into the topic. So we'll, we're going to talk about architecting and exploiting asymmetry in multi-core architectures. I'll give you a warning first. This is actually an asymmetric talk within itself. Uh, the first part of the, but we don't have to cover all of it actually, as I said earlier. The first talk, uh, part of the talk will be a case for asymmetry everywhere. This was actually, these are very old slides. Uh, this was from a talk that I delivered in 2010. At that point, uh, some researchers uh, gathered actually through NSF, the uh, National Science Foundation in the United States, uh, to figure out what are the important directions to revitalize computer architecture, going forward in computer architecture. And my uh, position was asymmetry everywhere. We should actually architect asymmetry everywhere. And I'll give you uh, my reasoning for that. So this will be more high level and goal uh, oriented. The second component will be a particular deep dive into some mechanisms to actually enable and exploit asymmetry in processing cores. Basically, you have large cores versus small cores. How do you actually exploit that to improve performance and efficiency? And actually, I guess there's a third component also, if we can get to it. Uh, we'll talk about asymmetry in memory controllers. If you don't get to it, this will be thriving. And when I say asymmetry, it's the same thing as heterogeneity. Uh, I will use them interchangeably. And it's a way to enable specialization and customization. It's, the, it's actually not the only way. But usually, whenever you try to enable customization and specialization, uh, whatever you come up with tends to, be, tends to look asymmetric at some point. OK. So let me go into the motivation. Uh, this was more motivation three or four years ago. Basically, if you look at the system, uh, any system today, hardware resources are shared among many threads, applications, uh, in a many core system. That's true for a data center system also. What are these resources? Cores, caches, interconnects, memory, disks, power, lifetime. You can add more resources. And ma managing these resources is actually a very, very difficult task. Managing one resource is a difficult task. We haven't figured out even how to manage the caches today very well. How do we manage many of these resources at the same time? Right? And this becomes especially hard when you're optimizing parallel or multi-programmed applications, because threads interact unpredictably and unfairly in these resources. 
And power and energy consumption is arguably the most valuable shared resource that we have today, because it's the main limiter uh, to efficiency and performance. And other problems, for example, a reliability problem can be translated to a power problem as well, uh, sometimes. Okay, if you look at the programmer perspective, maybe the most valuable resource is actually the programmer itself, right, their time. And writing even sequential software is hard enough for a programmer. Optimizing code for a, such a parallel shared resource system will be a nightmare. Actually, it, it already is a nightmare if you uh, do these programming. And we probably can tell you a lot more about that uh, than I, I can do. So uh, I would posit that programmers should not really worry about hardware resource management. They should be focusing on writing correct programs. They should not perhaps even worry about uh, optimizing their programs. Basically, what should be executed uh, where with what resources should not be the domain of the programmer. They can provide hints, but they shouldn't really worry about it. So future, uh, so, but somebody should do this, right? Which means that future computer architectures should do this. They should minimize the programming effort to optimize these pro parallel programs. And they should uh, manage these resources somehow. If the program is not managing these resources, somebody should, and that somebody should probably be the runtime system. Maybe hardware, software, cooperative components. And the architecture itself, the hardware itself, should be uh, designed to maximize the effectiveness of this runtime system in shared resource management. So we'll talk about that. Basically, future many core systems should manage power and performance and maybe other metrics automatically across threads and applications. And there are three goals in my mind. First is we should minimize energy and power consumption to improve scalability. The second, uh, we should satisfy the performance requirements or service level agreement requirements of different tasks. Well, uh, to provide predictability and quality of service. And third, certainly we should minimize program efforts in optimizing and uh, creating optimized parallel programs. And I would posit that to enable all of these at the same time. These are ma many different metrics, right? If you would like to optimize for all of these metrics at the same time, asymmetry and configurability and shared resources uh, are essential to achieve all of these goals. So what is asymmetry? If you look at uh, a symmetric system, it looks like this. And you can consider any resource. This could be a core, this could be a cache, this could be a, an interconnect, a portion of the interconnect. Basically, it's one size fits all. Uh, if you would like to have a task that requires more resource than this, well, uh, too bad. You, you, get, uh, you don't get the performance that's needed to execute that task, unless you partition that task somehow, which makes programmers life harder. Uh, if you like, if you have a task that's actually that doesn't require this resource, then your energy is suboptimal. Then you'll have to do all of these tricks to scale down the resource, which is actually a form of heterogeneity. Right? Basically, it's one size fits all. It's energy and performance suboptimal for different phase behaviors. On the other hand, an asymmetric system looks like this, and this could be this doesn't have to be static. This could be dynamically generated this way. Basically, you have resources that look different. Uh, and that difference enables trade-offs and customization because, because processing requirements vary different across different applications and across different phases. Now you can say application that requires more resource, it can go here. If it requires less resource, after some point it can go here. Right. So that's the idea. Basically you can execute the code on best fit resources if you can determine what's the best fit resource to get minimal energy and hopefully adequate performance as you need. So let's take the thought experiment a little bit further. This is an abstract resource. Why don't we design the entire system this way, right? Why don't we have a chip that looks like this? Actually, this can go beyond the chip. But a chip uh, that has hardware resources, and each of the resources has asymmetric, or reconfigurable, or configurable, or partitionable components that has different power, performance, and reliability characteristics that can adapt to different computation, communication, and access patterns. For example, you can have these high power, high performance cores, medium power, medium performance cores, and very low power, very low performance, many, many cores. You can have different memory hierarchies, you can have different interconnects, and you can have different memories. And we've been actually looking at all of these components to be asymmetric. And at the system level, now you can put together different asymmetric components as well. And a data center today looks kind of like that. You have a lot of heterogeneous uh, components in a data center. And uh, once you design the hardware this way, uh, why don't we design the runtime system, the hardware and software together, to automatically choose the best fit components for each phase. The hardware can say, I'm going to pick one of these. Uh, well, the runtime system can say, I'm, I'm going to pick one of these and pick a lean memory hierarchy and pick some memory technology for this particular phase behavior. This can hopefully satisfy performance and SLA for that phase with a minimal energy. 
And I think of this as dynamically stitching together the best fit chip for a given phase. And for example, phase one can do whatever I discussed earlier. You can have a high power, high performance core, lean cache, maybe almost no cache, maybe a streaming hierarchy over here, maybe some latency sensitive interconnect, and maybe some low, uh, uh, very fast memory, DRAM, instead of uh, a much, more, much higher latency memory. And for phase two, maybe the program looks like this. It doesn't require a lot of processing, but may require a lot of memory. Right. And for phase three, maybe the program looks like this. This looks more like a GPU, right? You have lots of uh, parallelism and maybe no cache almost, and a lot of memory bandwidth or memory capacity potentially. Right. And then you can actually start memorizing some of these phases. You can predict that you're going to get to phase one, and you can actually automatically configure, stitch together those resources again. So this is, of course, a thought experiment. It's still titled thought experiment. We're not there yet. I'm not going to tell you the techniques that do this automatically. But hopefully, you will take some baby steps. So once you have this, the third component of this is maybe you can have a software components that can be morphable to actually take advantage of these resources. And if some of the resources are not available, for example, you can uh, bring, bring in a software component that actually uses some other resource to actually execute the computation. And I don't know how to do this. Maybe Emery has answers. <laughs> that, can, that can tell you how to do this. Actually, he might. You can talk to him, too. But uh, uh, this is, I think, asymmetry enables something like this. You can uh, have code that can execute on different portions. But we'd like to do that, of course, without uh, making the programmer's life very hard. Version 1 can execute here. And if that high power, <laughs> high performance core is needed by someone else who really needs that resource, maybe you can execute that over here, if it's possible. And maybe a version 3 is partitioned. And these could actually represent different stages in uh, parallelization of an application. You don't want the programmer to be able to parallelize everything. But over time, maybe over decades, you can actually enable parallelization much more incrementally rather than right away. So asymmetry helps with that also. I think. So there are many research and design questions that I'm not going to answer in this talk, but I think this is a very exciting area given that what it enables. How do you design these asymmetric components is very interesting. Should they be fixed? Should they be partitionable? Should they be reconfigurable? And maybe we, have, we should have all of them at the same time. What types of asymmetry is interesting? What types of access patterns should you support? What types of technologies do you support in all of the parts of the system? What monitoring do you perform collaboratively in hardware and software to automatically discover these requirements? And maybe get some very simple hints from the programmer to enable that monitoring. Right? How do you design the feedback control loop between the uh, components and the runtime system software such, uh, such that you can actually enable this uh, stitching together of dynamic chips for each phase. And how do you design the runtime to automatically manage resources? How do you track task behavior and pick the best fit components? How do you merge runtime systems information from perhaps pro uh, with programmer hints to get the best of multiple worlds? I think there are a lot of issues that uh, are cross-cutting here that uh, require different metrics to be optimized. That's why I'm not going to be able to answer all of these. But hopefully, we'll, set, we'll take some baby steps uh, to manage one particular resource and a couple of particular resources. So how do we get there? I'll give you some very brief examples, uh, and then I'll do the deep dive into the heterogeneous course. Any questions so far? OK. Nobody's? Oh, yes. I have a philosophical question, mm -hmm. which is, uh, you have a big chip out of which, for a given phase, you decide this part of it is active, this part of it, and this part, this part. Is okay. And I was at a conference about the brain, and I got the, these images about the uh, fMRI, where you say, for you to this activity, there's they see the part of the brain which uh, actually uh, has more activity, more blood flow, <laughs> which is more energy to it. And I thought, well, this is a little bit like this type of approaches or DBFS or something like that. But then I asked the question, how much of the, is the average energy use for the brain? And it came out that it's 98% all of the time, continuously. Mm -hmm. So we kind of the brain as a solution that nature has found to survive, let's say to make survival machines, has come to a solution which is actually using 98% of the resources all of the time you know, compared to this approach. So are we, <laughs> is that something we should compare? Is that something? So I don't know, that's, that's a little bit beyond me, but uh, is, uh, let me ask you a question. Is it 98% of the energy that's dedicated uh, for that part of the brain 
that's active at that point, or 98% of all everything that's that, used that, in the brain. That specific part that you see on an, on an fMRI mm -hmm. image is only a plus 2% over the average background, oh, I see. background activity, which is kind of very different from these approaches. And, mm -hmm. and it, I would just, I don't know, think, I don't know. Yeah, so I'm not sure if I'll have a good answer. It's a good, great brainstorming topic. But uh, I think uh, here what I envision is not necessarily keeping only that part of the chip, chip active. So if you have some other applications, they will be using the other parts of the chip also. So you hopefully utilize most of your chip. Um, now you're, you're going to tell me what about power. And I, think, I believe we're going to get, to get to a point where we solve that problem also. But I'm not sure if I can make the comparison to the brain very well. I think we're, we're very far from getting, getting something similar to a brain. <laughs> and I'm not sure if we should get close to it, but let's, uh, we can discuss that, yes. So, um, so I, I have a maybe less, uh, how should I say, uh, less advanced philosophical question. Um, so you talked about phases and phase detection. So um, I personally don't believe in phases. Uh, I don't believe programs have phases, and I believe this is especially true if you have multiple threads, mm -hmm. because if you pretended that they have phases, now they don't anymore because they're all canceling each other out, right? You get this sort of noise. Um, it seems like when I look at this, the easiest way to approach this problem is sort of, I've got a multi-program platform, I've got a bunch of different programs running on it, I identify characteristics of these programs, and then I perform the mapping. Mm -hmm. So then it's really not a runtime system question, but an operating system. So I think uh, let's let's defer that and let's take a, uh, let's take a look at the uh, I think uh, programs may not have phases but maybe if you can figure out what is the critical part of the program to execute maybe you can ship that or execute uh, dedicate more resources to, to sure. resources. Okay. But but I wanted to just see if you are advocating for a fine grained approach or if you think that this sort of coarse grained approach also is compatible. So I think it's compatible. Yes, coarse grained approach is compatible. I think both needs to be done. But even in a multi-programmed execution, I, I think you can still have a fine-grained approach. You don't necessarily just nap, but you can do the prioritization. For example, you can have latent, the latent-sensitive portion of uh, a multi-programmed application that uses a latent-sensitive interconnect, a low latency interconnect. And then later on, the program can do something much more bandwidth-sensitive, and you can use a much more bandwidth-sensitive interconnect. I think this is the fine-grained approach you were talking about. We're probably talking about the same thing. But I think the coarse grain and fine grain has to be combined because we'll have all sorts of behavior in the future. Okay. Yes. Uh, when you have these kind of very complex systems with very different components together, I, I'm not sure if you're talking about one single chip or maybe multiple chips, but in any way, what may be difficult, and I don't know if you're going to talk about later, is unification. So, do you have some ideas or? Like some groups are already working mm -hmm. in how to verify that these things actually work when you are the That's right. So uh, it's always true that uh, a, a more complex system will be harder to verify. I think we'll have to bite the bullet. That's, if we want to design more efficient systems, it'll become at the cost of more complexity or verification. And that needs to be done, I think. And that's a great research area, perhaps. Otherwise, we can design very simple systems that are not uh, scaling upright. Okay, let's let's uh, let's get to some examples, and these, uh, that's a great question. Also, I'm not going to be ask, able to answer that question, but maybe we'll think about how to potentially verify what I'll describe. So let's uh, take one example. Basically, we can actually have high power, high performance cores that can execute the serial part of the program, and low power, low performance cores that can execute the parallel part of the program. And my main talk. Uh, will be about this today, so I'm not going to go into uh, detail right now about this. But the hope is that programmer can write less optimized but more likely correct programs if you do this. Uh, you can have memory hierarchies that are optimized for screening and optimized for random access. Right? Maybe cache, caches, uh, the cache hierarchies that are optimized for this. And once you detect different phases of a program, Emery does not believe in them, but I believe that they exist actually, depending on within a program, because you can actually stream data and then you can actually partition work, right? which could be streaming versus random access at the same time. Uh, this way, uh, you can get more efficient and higher performance in a general purpose hierarchy. 
the second, uh, again, you can have latent sensitive versus bandwidth sensitive programs as well as portions of a program. And you can design the interconnects and the memory controller such that it can dedicate that bandwidth differentially to these different applications. Hopefully you can get higher performance and higher energy efficiency that's symmetric and free for all systems. And I'm not going to talk about it, but we have a work in this year's design automation conference that looks at latency sensitive versus bandwidth sensitive networks. So you, have, you design two networks. One is optimized for latency, one is optimized for bandwidth. And you can get much better performance and efficiency than a monolithic two networks or a monolithic single network. And you can also have uh, different scheduling policies in the memory controller, and we'll try to get to this, uh, that uh, adapt, to different, adapt to the needs of different kinds of programs, compute intensive programs versus memory intensive programs, and you can apply different policies to get the, multiple, uh, get the best of multiple different metrics. You can get good performance as well as good fairness compared to homogeneous policy. So we'll try to talk about that today. And you can build main memory with different technologies that have different characteristics, right? Perhaps different energy, latency, wear, and bandwidth characteristics. Some have little amount of DRAM in the system, some amount of phase change memory, or some other technology that is non-volatile and has uh, a high energy efficiency. And you can try to partition data between these different memories and automatically move the data uh, such that you, get, uh, you achieve better performance and efficiency. So this will be, I'll, I'll discuss this in, on Friday if you're interested in that. This is, uh, I think, a, an exciting topic also. Okay, let me jump into what, what we can do in the processing cores, like so the critical sections. What is the problem? Yeah, the problem is the serialized code sections in parallel applications. Multi-threaded applications, you all know that programs are split into threads, and threads concur execute concurrently on multiple cores. The problem is that many parallel applications cannot be parallelized completely. And this is Amdahl's law. Uh, but we're going to look much more beyond that as well. We're going to look at serialized code sections in general, any kind of serialization. Reduces performance, limits scalability. Scalability means how many threads can you actually execute, and where, when does the performance saturate. And wastes also, also energy. Anytime you're doing waiting, you're wasting energy. And what are the causes of these serialized code sections? Sequential portions, this was what Amdahl was actually concerned about. You have one thread that's executing and no other thread. And that uh, you know very well, right? That limits your performance. Even if uh, only 1% of your uh, program's execution time is the sequential portion, the maximum speed up you can get is 100 right? with infinite number of processes. But there are many other serialized sections in programs, like critical sections that can serialize code, serialize different threads. Barriers. One thread may be reaching the barrier late. And limiter stages in pipeline parallel programs, they're all serialized code sections. I'll call these bottlenecks with a little bit more formal definition. I'll define this as any code segment for which threads contend or wait. And serial portions, we've already talked about it. Critical sections, these ensure mutual exclusion. We're going to cover a lot about this in the first part. And these are likely to be on the critical path of contendent. Barriers, these ensure all threads reach a point before continuing. And the latest thread arriving at the barrier determines uh, your performance, at least for that particular point. And it's likely on the critical path. Pipeline stages, uh, you all know pipeline parallelism. <coughs> different stages of a loop iteration can, may execute on different threads. Uh, and in this case, slowest stage makes other threads wait. Uh, and that is likely on the critical path. And we're going to look at this later on. Well, first, let me uh, talk about critical sections. These are actually easy to handle with heterogeneity. Basically, if you have a serial part, it makes sense to execute on a high power, high performance core, assuming you benefit from it. Right? If you don't benefit from it, you don't want to waste energy executing on a high power or high performance course. So for the rest of this talk, I'm going to assume that uh, uh, we're going to benefit by sh uh, from shipping a serialized code section to a large core. We can execute it faster. Now that will be the assumption. That will uh, not, be the, uh, not necessarily be correct. So we're going to model it correctly in the simulations that I'm going to describe. But we have some work that I'm not going to describe today that it just appeared in ISCA that tries to predict if I ship this code to a large core, will it actually improve performance? It's called utility-based acceleration. And the idea is to determine the utility of using a large core to execute a piece of code. So you can actually use that work that I'm not going to describe today to, and apply it to everything that I said today. And you can hopefully solve that problem. <laughs> OK, let's talk about critical sections. Uh, basically, critical sections exist because threads are not allowed to update shared data concurrently. Uh, this is for correctness purposes. And access to shared data 
are protected with critical sections. They're encapsulated. You can think of them lock and unlock, right? That's considered a critical section. And only one thread can execute a critical section at a given time. This is one example, very high level. MySQL is actually a very nice example that has lots of critical sections. Basically, when a thread gets generated, it opens some database tables that it's going to operate on. And this, these database tables are actually a lot of shared data. And then, after opening the table, it performs the operations on the rows and columns of a database. And this is usually parallel. There's some critical section inside there also. But if you look at this, the open, open tables cache that each thread needs to look at over here is a shared data structure. And there's a lot of contention that happens. And it's a critical section that needs to be protected. This is a very high-level abstraction of MySQL. If you want to learn more, you can actually go and look at the code. But uh, let's do a thought experiment. What happens for uh, contention with critical sections? I'll, uh, I'll give you uh, an execution timeline over here. goes from 0 to 12 time units. And we're going to look at a uh, program that has 12 iterations, where 33% of instructions are inside the critical section. And critical sections denoted as red. With one processor, execution time looks like this. We have 12 iterations. With two processors, we can have two threads. And uh, they both cannot be in the critical section at the same time, but otherwise they can execute in parallel. So per performance improves. With three threads, performance improves a little bit. As long as you ensure that threads are not in the critical section, uh, it's fine. You get better performance. With four threads, if you look at this, performance doesn't improve anymore. <laughs> Why? Because this pre-threaded version of the program was actually critical section limited. If you look at this, at any given point in time, there's a thread that's executing critical sections. So the critical path goes through these critical sections in this program. So if you add one more thread, basically you add more weighting into the program. So performance doesn't improve. In fact, this is not realistic. Performance degrades in most cases. Because when you add one more thread, what happens is you actually add more ping-ponging into the system. And you add more contention to the system as well. As a result, uh, performance doesn't improve, and the scalability of the application doesn't improve. Let's say magically we were able to accelerate these critical sections by 2x. Let's take a look at how the performance is affected by this. In this case, single thread version improves a little bit. Two threaded version again improves a little bit. Three threaded version again improves a little bit. And when you get to the four threaded version, you actually get performance improvement over the four threaded version. But also you get scalability improvements, meaning that the 3D threaded version of this program that has faster critical sections now runs even faster if you actually increase the number of threads. Why? Because by reducing the amount of time spent in the critical sections, we make this 3D threaded version non-critical section bound. Right? It's not, the critical path is not the critical section anymore. So you can have more scalable programs this way if you can somehow reduce the amount of time spent in the critical section. That's the uh, key point. You can increase performance and improve scalability. Well, let me recap all of it. Contention for critical sections leads to serial execution of threads in the parallel program per portion. Right? And this contention for a critical section actually limits scalability as well. Scalability means the number of threads at which performance saturates. Let me give you one example. So this is MySQL. As you increase uh, the per uh, number of cores, number of threads dedicated to MySQL from 1 to 32 over here, this is the speed up you get compared to a single thread version of the program. And this is a normal speed up curve that you would see. Performance peaks at about 16 or 17 threads over here, and after that it goes down because of ping-ponging and content bandwidth contention. This is with a symmetric core. And this is what you would get with an asymmetric core by accelerating critical sections, as I will discuss, uh, for MySQL. Basically, you get much better scalability. Performance keeps improving. And we're going to make this even better with some of the other techniques that we'll, we're going to discuss. Uh, later on. Okay, well, I guess I have a duplicate slide here. So that's what happens with uh, PowerPoint. <laughs> okay, so basically execution time of these uh, sequential kernels, critical sections, and limiter stages must be short. And one could argue that why not punt? I mean, why not say, I don't care about this. The programmer should deal with this. And I think with symmetric multi-core systems, uh, that's what we would probably do, right? The problem is, uh, it's very difficult for the programmer to do this. And once, you, once the programmer actually tries to shorten the critical sections, you get to a trade-off, correctness versus performance trade-off. Right? They start forgetting these critical sections. They start protecting wrong things. It's a lot easier for the programmer to protect at a much coarser grain than a finer grain. And even if the programmer protects at a finer grain, uh, 
when, when the hardware uh, varies, that pro program may not perform as well anymore. Right? So you have variation hardware platforms, limited program resources, and sometimes the programmer may not even have the domain knowledge as well. Right? Not everybody's an expert in programming, uh, parallel programming. So our goal is to have a mechanism to shorten these serial bottlenecks in general without requiring programmer effort, or while minimizing the programmer effort as much, uh, as much as possible. And the idea, as I've already given you, is to accelerate these serialized code sections by shipping them to powerful cores in a symmetric multi-core processor called ACMP. What is an ACMP? Uh, basically, an ACMP provides one large core, or one or more large cores, and many small cores. And the baseline that I will assume is the parallel part of the program is executed on the small cores, and the AMDAL serial part, when one single thread exists, it's executed on the large core. Uh, and this is already proposed earlier before, and it just makes sense. It's pretty simple uh, to do, right? On top of this, uh, what happens in a conventional asymmetric multi-core processor when you get to a critical section? Let's say processor 3 is the core that's executing the critical section, and P2, processor 2, encounters the critical section. Basically, it sends a request for the lock. That lock needs to get transferred to processor 2's cache, and processor 2 acquires the lock. That's the ping pong game. And it executes the critical section after it acquires the lock. And after it's done, it releases the lock, and some other processor requests the lock. And that's, again, ping pong. With an asymmetric, uh, with accelerated critical sections, we're going to change that model. Basically, we're not going to only execute the serial part over here, but all critical sections will be shipped to the large core as well. And this is author Lehman's work, and this is the paper that I'll briefly discuss. For this, you need to have a request buffer in the large core that accepts request from the small cores saying, I would like to execute this critical section. Okay. So let's take a look at how execution is done in accelerated critical sections. Basically, we add a critical section request buffer, which is a FIFO queue at uh, the large cores, uh, uh, large cores hardware. And when processor 2 encounters the critical section, it executes the critical section calls, yes call instruction. We're going to add the special instruction. Processor 2 sends this critical section call request to this critical section request buffer, no lock request to some other core, which means that no ping ponging here, right? We're going to replace the ping ponging with the critical section call. This critical section call request gets queued in processor 1's critical section request buffer, and when processor 1 has nothing else to execute, it picks one of these critical section requests and starts executing it. It executes the critical section, and then when it's done, it sends a critical section down signal to processor 2. And now processor 2 can continue execution. So basically, all of the critical sections will be shipped to processor 1. Uh, there are some ISA extensions. So we actually modify the ISA to do this. One possibility to do this trans completely transparently, it turns out actually it's not easy to detect critical sections, uh, at least all of the critical sections, uh, that way. And this is a problem that people have had at Intel when they implemented uh, some of the hardware lock and lesion mechanisms also. Uh, in Intel has well. And I'd encourage you to take a look at that. You probably know some of that as well. But uh, we're going to modify the ISA. And it's a great research topic to actually look at figuring out how to do this perfectly in hardware, I think. Uh, basically, we have, we have critical section call and critical section return instructions. And the compiler and library insert, inserts these instructions. And the, if the programmer is programming nicely with libraries, then this is easy to do. If the programmer is actually not programming nicely and doing critical sections in some other way, to optimize extremely carefully, then it's not easy to do. But the programmer can actually insert these instructions also. So if the programmer is knowing what they're doing, they can actually take advantage of the mechanisms that's provided over here. Uh, so let's take a look at actually uh, this pictorially. So let's say you have this simple code that's normally executed on a small core. You compute something, and you generate some data value that's later input into the critical section. And the critical section actually does something to that value. Basically, there's a lock and unlock, and the critical section computes a result with that input value. And then later, it prints the result. We're going to partition this uh, with some code changes with the, uh, within the library and the compiler. Basically, small core, uh, after it generates A, it will push that on the stack, and then it will do a critical section call uh, to, uh, with the lock address and the target program counter. And once that critical section call executes, a critical section call request is sent to the large core. It basically sends a lock address, target program counter, the stack pointer, and the core ID that's requesting the critical section. And this large core basically queues that, queues that request up in the critical section request buffer. After some point, 
that becomes the oldest. And this is the code that executes on the large part. It first it basically jumps to this target program counter, which is modified the acquired to lock first. And then it pops uh, the uh, pushed arguments. In this case, there's only one argument. It executes the meat of the critical section. And then it pushes the results onto the stack. It releases the lock and executes a critical section return instruction, which generates a critical section done response, uh, which sends a transaction on the interconnect to the core that generated the request with the core ID. And then that core can continue now. It basically has code that pops the result and prints the result. So these blue parts are the modifications that need to be done by the library to actually enable this execution. And this is what's needed, the, sub, the hardware support that's needed on the interconnect and hardware support that's needed on the large core. Yes? I have a question. So large core actually executes critical section as an interrupt? Or is it idle, or what does it do? So that's a good question. We're assuming here large core is allocated to the application that's actually running. Basically, it's part. It's, it, it has all the context of the parallel uh, application, multi-threaded application. It executes something and the request arrives. It executes in interrupt mode. No, it it basically gets the critical section request buffer. So we're assuming that it's executing nothing at that point in time. Yes, but. Uh, that's a good question. What, what if there's another application that's requesting? What if there are multiple applications that's requesting? And in that case, it's really not interrupt. It's not software. It's all hardware supported uh, migration. So we don't actually interrupt what's running over there. It's all handled in hardware. You have a queue, and that hardware queue re receives a request from multiple different applications and basically prioritizes between them. And that's covered in our ISCA paper this year in the utility-based acceleration. In this case, right now, I'm going to assume there's only one single application running, and we're accelerating that. And the large core is dedicated for that. Yes. So I have a follow-up to a similar question. What happens if the critical section contains a call to the operating system? Right, so it has some sort of blocking call that goes into the kernel. Mm -hmm. So you, know, you said it's not an interrupt, but now clearly you have to communicate with the operating system. You have to be able to suspend the state. You, have a, you sort of have to have an interrupt-like mechanism somehow handle that case, right? Or do you That's just ignore those cases? So for now, for now we ignore that. That's in the is, is, is paper. We can, we can talk about that actually in detail. You can actually handle all of those issues. All right. Yes? Typically, if uh, this uh, critical section is as small as possible, just for the, to get mm -hmm. as much parallelism as possible, but does it pay off to make all this migration? Yes, so I'll show you results related to that. And uh, I'll improve the work later on, such that we take that into account. Right now, you're right, we're sending everything to the large core. That may not be the best thing to do. You really want to send what's on the critical path to the large core, and we're, we're going to get to that. Yes? Or, or related to that, the question is, besides what you do, you also have to do, if you have multiple applications, you have to contact switch to mm -hmm. change the to change the so, so all that over there is also taking. So in this, right now, I'm assuming there's one single application. But in the ISCA paper, uh, we, we handle the multiple application case. We can talk about that offline. But there, there's additional overhead that needs to happen. That's right, yes. So you, uh, you would like to keep the state of each application in the TLB. Uh, basically, you need to have, you have a multi-threaded context in the large core. So large core design is actually important over here. If you have to change, if you have to uh, basically, uh, do a TLD flush every time uh, some other application requests uh, something from the large core that's not going to work. Basically, you need to have the support such that you can cache from multiple applications at the same time. So it's a multi-threaded uh, context that you have in the large core. And the hope is that you can design that large core to be beefy anyway, right? Your goal is to execute fast. Okay. It's all great questions, actually. <laughs> that's what's needed to enable such a system like this. Yes. But you can achieve the heterogeneity you want and also reduce all the verification costs that the handle was commenting. If what the kind of thing you do is using, let's say, kind of identical cores, but what you do is kind of a, some a voltage increase or something like this in time so that you really can execute faster in the same code. Does it make sense? Uh, uh, you, you do what? I, I don't I think catch that. Uh, increase the voltage. Oh, increase the voltage. So that's a sure. That's that's another way of achieving heterogeneity. And, and that's right. Now you don't necessarily need to move, but uh, there are benefits provided from a large core also that's beyond the voltage scale. And I believe going forward, that's uh, that's that's a good direction also. Looking at 
Do I increase the voltage? Do I move to the large core? I think that's a, uh, you, you get different kinds of benefits from that. With a large core, for example, you get much better memory latency tolerance assuming you're, you have a large window and you have the mechanism to tolerate that memory latency. With increasing the frequency, you may not buy you that. Yes? Can you suggest in your performance if you have, I mean, you have some overhead in movie that gives connection to the, to the power and the core. Uh, the question is, no, there is no other threat contending for the law. It doesn't make sense to move it to that core. You just keep running on the small core. On the small core? So if you have not explored it, in, in all of this, uh, basically, small core basically blocks waiting for the request. And if, if your small core is multi-threaded, though, you can actually do uh, what you suggest. Right, because in most cases, uh, I mean, it does the, the whole side behind transactional memory. In most cases, you take it a lock and nobody else is contending for the lock. Mm -hmm. So you can just read that overhead of moving the lock, the critical section to the, lock, to the large core. As long as there is nobody else contending for that, just keep it. No oh, oh, I see. So uh, what you're saying is don't move it if there's no contention. Right. Yes, we're going we're, we're gonna to look at that. We're going to get to that. That's right. That's the optimal. For now, let's, take, let's do the experiment that we're going to move all critical sections of the large core. But that's not a good thing. I agree. So we're going to uh, refine that. But then the question is what critical sections do you move? And we're going to uh, tackle that problem. Okay? Okay. So there's one problem. Uh, and probably some of you may have guessed this. You, there's another problem for uh, if you actually send the critical sections uh, to a single core, now you're creating a bottleneck, like this large core. But if two critical sections are parallel and two uh, cores actually request that, uh, request different critical sections to be exerted on uh, that single core. Now this leads to the problem of false serialization, right? Independent critical sections can be serialized and we have a mechanism to solve this. Basically the idea is to selectively accelerate one of them. If you actually, the idea at a high level is the large core keeps track of how much false serialization is caused for a given critical section and basically denies the request of a small core saying that I've serialized your request so don't send me these critical sections anymore. Basically, that's the idea. Let's take a look at it very briefly. Uh, very, this problem is going to be fixed if you don't send a lot of uh, critical sections to large core. But let's say you have lock A and B and this is a critical section request buffer and these are requests are coming from small cores and large cores picking them. Critical section called A comes. In this case, A is not serialized, so we're going to decrement a counter in the large core, saying that this is the serialization count for these different critical sections. And A can execute. Another request comes for a critical section called A. It has to be serialized, right? That's the semantics of the program. So this is the point. Small core is doing, uh, large core is doing the right thing, so we're going to decrement this false serialization counter. Now, critical section called B comes. If this had executed in the small cores, it would have executed in parallel with critical section called A, right? Which means that the large core is now serializing it. So it's going to increment this counter saying B has been serialized a lot. And once this counter reaches a threshold, the large core says, OK, I don't want this critical section call request, so don't send it to me. So there's mechanisms in the interconnect that enable this. So ev like everything else in the world, there are pluses and minuses with ACS. And some of you have discovered the pluses and minuses. Uh, the plus is faster critical section execution. The assumption again is that once you ship the critical section, it executes faster. Uh, the, there are a couple of other pluses, which is actually shared locks stay in one place. You get better lock locality. And hopefully you design these large cores cache to be large as well. So you have shared locks not ping-ponging anymore. Shared data also stays in large cores, large caches. So you get better shared data locality. Again, less ping-ponging of the shared data itself. Basically, we're really shipping the computation to the data now, uh, to the shared data. Minuses, large score is dedicated for critical sections. You get reduced parallel throughput. Now you can actually not dedicate it, multi-thread it. And we've explored a lot of these different choices, and I'd be happy to talk about it uh, uh, in detail later on. Uh, the second, we're actually transferring the locks to uh, the overhead of locking to a critical section call and critical section, uh, section down signaling overheads. Now we have a control transfer overhead. <laughs> And the third downside is thread now uh, we, we are keeping shared data in one place, but what about the data that's thread private, that's input to the critical section? Normally that would stay in the small core, small cache, right? Normally that would not ping pong. Now we're going to send that. That needs to be transferred to large source cache. So we get worse private data locality. I'll call this private data. But we're going to solve that problem. I would argue that this is an easier problem to solve than shared data problem. It's very hard to predict where to send the shared data next, because it's very hard to figure out which, uh, 
processor will access the lock next. But now we're going to send the critical sections to a known processor, which means that we can probably figure out this data and send it to that known processor maybe earlier. And we're going to try to do that. Uh, I'll talk about that mechanism. So let's take a look at this trade-off in a little bit more detail. Basically, we have fewer parallel threads because we're dedicating the large core to critical sections. Uh, but on the other hand, we're accelerating critical sections. It turns out this is a better trade-off uh, to make. Accelerating critical sections offsets the loss in throughput. Uh, this is assuming that you actually have uh, enough cores, enough budget for cores. Uh, and this is actually in favor, uh, the trends are in favor. As the number of cores on chip increases, uh, the fractional loss in parallel performance actually decreases. So for example, if you have an area budget of eight small cores, and if you dedicate four of them to the large core, you lose 50% parallel throughput. But if you have an area budget of 100 small cores, and if you dedicate, let's say, eight of them to uh, be the large core, then you your fractional loss is only 92%, uh, only 8%, right? Yes, not 92%. That would be terrible. OK. So the, the trends are hopefully in favor of actually uh, not uh, uh, dedicating that large core. We have the overhead of critical section call and down signal versus better lack of lock locality, right? Uh, actually, ping pong, avoiding the ping-ponging on blocks is a better idea in this case, as long as you have fast migration. If your migration, you have to go through the operating system to migrate, then that's probably not a good idea. So you need this hardware support. And we get more cache misses for private data, which is input to the critical section, but we now have fewer cache misses for shared data. And which one do you think uh, is higher in workloads? Private data or shared data? Shared data. That's what I would argue also. But if you look at these workloads, it goes both ways. That's what I would think too. So uh, the, what, what we found is in some programs, uh, programmer doesn't optimize the code very well. So there's a lot of private data that goes into the critical section. So uh, just to uh, uh, reinforce Emery's intuition, why is shared data larger? This is a task queue example from one of the benchmarks. You basically have a priority. Uh, you have a heap data structure, a private queue. And this is a shared data. Uh, and we're going to insert some new problem, which is the private data, and that's the critical section. Basically, that insertion is done in a critical section. Now, to be able to insert these problems, basically, you need to determine the priority levels as you go through this tree, and you need to touch a lot of shared data to figure that out. So, to be able to insert one element into one node into this tree, you touch a bunch of shared data. So that, uh, that that's the intuition. Basically, shared data is usually larger than private data. But that's not always the case because programmers don't optimize their programs very well. Sometimes you touch a lot of private data. So basically, uh, with accelerated critical sections, cache miss is reduced if shared data is greater than private data. But that's not always the case. But we're going to get back to this. We're going to fix this problem. OK, so let's take a look at some comparison points with accelerated critical sections. I'm going to assume this is the baseline, symmetric multi-core, lots of small cores with conventional locking. This is also another baseline, asymmetric multi-core with conventional locking. And when you have a serial part uh, that's executed in the large core. And accelerated critical sections is basically executes both the serial part and the critical sections, as I described in the large core. Uh, this is our methodology. Basically, we have 12 critical section intensive applications uh, from a variety of workloads. And we have a multi core x86 simulator. And the details of the core are here. Basically, the large core is an out of order core, it's more Pentium like, Pentium 4 like. Uh, and the small core is in order. And because uh, we're going to assume the frequencies are the same, but if you actually do the frequencies different, you get similar results. And uh, the interconnect is, of course, modeled uh, as well. That's important. OK, so this is uh, the performance results. Uh, on the x-axis, I show uh, different workloads. And I divide them into coarse grain locks versus fine grain locks. <coughs> this is, these are uh, workloads where the programmer presumably didn't optimize the program well. So uh, critical sections are much larger. Critical sections are much smaller over here. And this is the harmonic mean across all applications. And y-axis shows the speed up over the symmetric multi-core. Symmetric multi-core means 32 small cores. And asymmetric multi-core, we're assuming one large and 28 small cores in this case. And the comparison over here, we're assuming the number of threads for each workload on each system is set to the best number of threads for that particular workload on that particular system. So we don't want to compare at a point where the workload is not scalable on any system. Uh, and if you look at this, uh, the core screen, uh, well, there are two bars. One is the first one is accelerating basically serial parts executed on the large core. If you do that, that's our baseline. We're going to assume that. You get performance benefits. 
And in uh, quicksort serial parts are actually large, that's why you get a lot of performance benefit. And the blue uh, bar shows what if you do x ray critical sections. And if you look at this with coarse grain locks, x ray critical sections buys you a lot, as expected. And fine grain locks, there are some cases where you don't actually improve performance significantly, but overall, the performance is still, uh, performance improvement is still significant. So overall, uh, by accelerating uh, M dot serial part, you get about 7%. By accelerating critical sections on top of that, you get about 30% or so. Yes? Are you going to show us a breakdown as to uh, where the performance is coming from? Because my intuition is it's mostly coming from avoiding cache misses. So that's an excellent question. That's in the paper. And uh, we actually looked at that. The different applications show different behavior. So for coarse grain locks, a lot of the performance improvements is actually coming from accelerating critical sections as well. For fine grain locks, you're right. In this, in this case, a lot of the benefit is actually coming from keeping the shared data and the locks in one place. And you, you can actually do this study. It's not here, it's in the paper. Basically, back to the paper. The paper version doesn't have a good one. If you like the I can give you better data probably. But you can actually do the study with not uh, asymmetric cores, right? You can actually symmetric cores and you can distribute the locks such that shared data states in one place and you get much better performance in these applications especially. Okay. Uh, and this, these are the scalable fields. Also, it's a lot of data, I know, but I want to focus on perhaps a couple. Let's take a look at this application, for example. Basically, this is speed up curve I showed you earlier, uh, and uh, we show symmetric multi-core, the green one, asymmetric multi-core, the red one, and this is speed up compared to a single thread, single thread version of the program. And this is ACS. So ACS basically gets you to a better scalability point. The number of threads at which performance saturates increases with accelerated critical sections. And performance also increases, as you see over here. And there are some applications where performance keeps scaling. This is the uh, MySQL workload that we had looked at before. And this is some other application that's very not, not very scalable. It's very, very much critical section bound. This is with coarse grain critical sections. So overall, uh, the scalability of seven of these applications actually improves. And performance also improves. OK. So let me summarize very quickly. Basically, critical sections reduce performance and limit scalability. And accelerating critical sections by executing them on a powerful core uh, uh, is the idea that we discussed. It reduces the average execution time by this much. And performance benefits come from two reasons. One is accelerating critical sections, and the other is keeping shared data and locks in one place. And it improves scalability of 7 of the 12 workloads. So once, once we've done this, we also want to generalize the idea now. We, we talked about some bottlenecks before, and critical section is only one bottleneck. How do we actually apply something like this by, uh, to all of these bottlenecks that we've discussed earlier? That's the next thing I'm going to tackle. How do we actually figure out these bottlenecks, and how do we execute them on a powerful core in a better manner such that we don't actually ship everything to the large core? Yes? So the example is show you have one powerful core and 28 small cores. Mm -hmm. You try to run your results, let's say, on just four powerful cores. Because from my point of view, it will be even more power efficient and even provide even better performance. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying four powerful cores, nothing else. Yes. So, uh, yes, that's uh, it's it's not in the paper, but we looked at it and we found that that doesn't provide the best performance either. So some for some workloads, it does provide good performance, but still not as good as ACS. It's still not as good as symmetric multi-core also. Symmetric multi-core meaning 32 small cores. But you're right. I think that's that's a very good po uh, comparison point also. You you can find it in our latest paper, I think. And if not, you can send me an email. Yes. What is going to have here? Uh, so, from the operating system point of view or the application point of view, what you have this file, this huge core, the small cores. How is this exposed to the operating system? Are you is the operating system managing also the a huge core or is something internal that is not exposed to the operating system? So the operating system basically says these are the applications that are mapped to this large core. In this case, there's a single application. We don't deal with that issue over here. But uh, internally, the hardware manages the resource. The operating system says, here's the resource, manage it. So it's selling or the operating system is just taking the, the huge core and the small cores as a whole. Yes, that's right. Okay. That's right. But there may be better ways of doing it. And I think there's an interesting research topic going forward. My main concern is how do you deal with uh, interrupting as oh, core? So in this case, it's basically part of the, this is, this is part of the application. The large core is part of the application. Okay.
So let's try to so fix some of the problems that we have here and generalize the idea. Let me give you the one slight summary. And again, you can sleep and <laughs> after that, <laughs> you can wake up. Basically, uh, the problem is the same. Performance and scalability of multivariate applications are limited by serializing bottlenecks. Now we're going to try to generalize that serializing bottlenecks. And there are different types of these critical sections, barriers, and small pipeline stages. And importance of these actually can change over time at a very fine grade, criticality. So far, we have not considered the importance of a critical section that much. Our goal is to dynamically identify the most important bottlenecks and accelerate them. There are two key questions. How do you identify the critical bottlenecks that are on the critical path of execution? And how do you efficiently accelerate them? Uh, the solution is bottleneck identification and scheduling that I'll describe. And it's a sort of hardware software cooperative solution. The idea is to have the software to annotate potential bottlenecks with bottleneck call and bottleneck return instructions and implement waiting for bottlenecks uh, with a special instruction called bottleneck wait. And the hardware using these special instructions identifies the bottlenecks that cause the most thread waiting, and that's used as a uh, proxy for criticality of the bottleneck, how important the bottleneck is, and accelerate those bottlenecks on large cores of an asymmetric multi-core system. And I'll show you that this improves multi-thread application performance as well as scalability, outperforms what I described earlier, accelerated critical sections, and performance improves with more cores. Let's take a look at these bottlenecks first. These are the bottlenecks that we're going to target. Critical sections, barriers, and pipeline stages. One observation is that these limiting bottlenecks change at a very fine grain over time. And I'll give you a cooked up example uh, that Jose cooked up, who did, who did this work. Jose Joao did this work, and he cooked up this example, which is a nice example, I think. But uh, whenever you cook up an example, it's very easy to find uh, programs that have similar behavior. So it's not going to be hard to actually demonstrate this on real applications. So we're going to have two linked lists. Uh, one is A is a full linked list, B is an empty linked list, and we're going to have threads do the same thing. The first thread, uh, each thread removes one element from the full linked list, does something on it, and inserts that element to the empty linked list. And the first removing the element from the full linked list is a critical section. Inserting that element to the initially empty linked list is another critical section. And threads are going to do the same thing. Now let's take a look at the contention on these two locks while threads are doing that same thing. This is with 32 threads and with some size of the uh, full weight list initially. And this is time on the x-axis. This is the number of threads waiting for these two different locks, blue and red, over time. If you look at this, initially lock A is the limiter. There are 32 threads or 31 threads waiting for lock A initially. And then that, thread, that number goes down as the size of the linked list reduces. After some point, lock B becomes a limiter as the size of the second linked list increases. Right. Uh, and at some point in the middle, it's not clear which one is the limiting lock, right? Uh, it's, uh, because both locks actually have threads waiting in front of them. So if you look at this behavior, this is similar uh, in MySQL also. Limiting bottlenecks change at a very fine grain in real applications as well. This is time on the order of millions of cycles. And these are two locks. One is the lock open, which is opening the database tables. And the second is logging. That's the log for the database. And there are many other locks in MySQL, but I'm uh, focusing on two here. This shows contention, number of threads waiting, with a maximum of 16 threads over here. If you look at this, there are several points where the log lock is the bottleneck. It has many threads waiting. And there are some points where the, the open lock is the bottleneck. So ideally, we'd like to identify what is the bottleneck at any given point in time? What is the critical? Uh, bottleneck at any given point in time and ship that to the large core. Let's cover previous work very briefly. And we'd like to do this not only for locks, but also other uh, parts, other synchronization constructs as well. Uh, I already told you about uh, ACMP proposals. They only accelerate the MDAL bottleneck. We have already talked about accelerated critical sections. And you also uh, told me that this doesn't take into account the importance of a critical section, right? If a critical section is not contended, maybe you don't want to accelerate it, right? Although there may be other reasons, like shared data locality, to send it there. And I think going forward, future work perhaps should look at, should I accelerate it? Should I improve shared data locality? Or should I keep it over here? Uh, there's work on pipeline parallel programs. This is work by Arthur Suleiman. And uh, the idea is to have a software library that detects what is the slowest pipeline stage. And you can do that at a coarse grain. You can look at uh, intervals in the order of milliseconds and figure out the pipeline stage that has the lowest throughput. And in the next interval, assuming that that's going to be, uh, still have the lowest throughput, you can ship it to the large core. Right? 
This is slow to adapt to phase changes, and we're going to have comparisons to that. Uh, uh, so no previous work can extract all three types of bottlenecks at the same time, or quickly adapt to fine grained changes in the importance of the bottlenecks. So we're going to try and uh, design a mechanism that does both. Extracts the three bottlenecks that I described, as well as adapt to changes that are very fine grained. If you actually plot the behavior of a pipeline parallel program, there, the bottleneck state changes uh, very quickly uh, in, the, in, the order, uh, in the order of millions of cycles, actually, that I, as I showed you over here. Okay, the idea of the bottleneck identification is scheduling. And the key insight is thread weighting reduces parallelism and is likely to reduce performance. And the code that's causing thread weighting is actually on the, likely on the critical path of execution. Now, that's not always true. Uh, and we would like to identify, uh, the key idea is to dynamically identify bottlenecks that cause the most thread weighting and accelerate them using powerful cores and ACM. Let's take a look at how we can do this. Basically, the compiler and the library, uh, or the library, and hopefully not the programmer, but they can if they want again, annotates bottleneck code and implements waiting for bottlenecks with special instructions. You have a binary containing bottleneck identification and scheduling instructions, BIS instructions. The hardware using these instructions measure thread waiting cycles for each bottleneck and accelerate the bottlenecks that has the highest thread waiting cycles. Let's take a look at the compiler or library support for this. This is uh, a critical section, one version over here. Basically, you wait for the critical section and then you execute the critical section. We're going to offline this code and we're going to encapsulate it with bottleneck call and bottleneck return. And you have bottleneck IDs and these are assigned globally, so actually the linker eventually has to do this. Uh, and you have a target program counter and this is the bottleneck return for the bottleneck ID. And this is the critical section. We're going to change this waiting to a bottleneck wait, a special hardware instruction that takes the bottleneck ID Basically, you're waiting for this bottleneck ID, and that watches an address. When that address changes, you actually can execute. Uh, this is used to keep track of waiting cycles. And bottleneck call and bottleneck return are actually used to enable acceleration. They, they delineate the critical section in this case. So you can do this for uh, barriers as well as pipeline stages. And I'll not go over this in detail, but you can here look at this. You can encapsulate the barriers with bottleneck call and bottleneck return. And while not all threads are in the barrier, you're waiting for the bottleneck. Similarly, for pipeline stages, if the input queue is empty, you're really waiting for the previous bottleneck ID. If the output queue is full, you're really waiting for the next bottleneck ID. And this is actually where uh, the bottleneck execution happens. So basically, we annotate the programs this way with bottleneck call, bottleneck return, and bottleneck wait instructions. Uh, and once that's done, you have a binary containing these instructions. Let's take a look at how hardware uses them to actually uh, figure out the thread waiting cycles caused by each bottleneck. Uh, this, is, this addresses one of the comments that you made. Basically, performance limiting bottleneck identification actually, uh, identification and acceleration are actually independent tasks. Acceleration can be accomplished in multiple ways. One could be you can increase core frequency and voltage. Right? Uh, the second could be prioritization of shared resources. Let's say you actually figured out this is the bottleneck, critical bottleneck. It's causing a lot of thread waiting. You can prioritize them in the memory controller. You can prioritize them in uh, that bottleneck in the cache. I mean, you've done some work that shows that there's significant benefit to this. This is Iman Ibrahimi's work, Parallel Application Memory Scheduling in Micro 2011. If you figure out the critical thread, prioritize them in the mem memory controller. And you can migrate to faster cores in an asymmetric multi-core. Right? That's another. And I think going forward, combining these mechanisms and figuring out which one is the most effective will lead to a better system that can do uh, much better than what I'll describe. Yes? Uh, regarding that identification using the pendant, a bottleneck is really dependent on the architecture you're running on. That's right, yes. So if you put that in the software and then you put it on another core that has different characteristics, maybe that's not the bottleneck. Yes, so that's why... So if you have a highly configurable thing like what you were explaining mm -hmm. At the, at the introduction, mm -hmm. uh, it's not clear that the bottleneck will be forever there. Yes. Do you think it's a good idea to put it in the in the binary in the programs? So the binary without just without having any knowledge of where you. Run so uh, binary just delineates uh, what could be a potential bottleneck. We're not going to accelerate that. We're, we're now I'm going to show you how the hardware can actually figure out which one is the more important one. Okay. Binary just tells the hardware. This could be a potential bottleneck, and this is the waiting that happens. And the hardware now keep, will keep track of how, which bottleneck has caused how much waiting 
And it's going to try to accelerate those bottlenecks that has caused the most pain. So it's more hints than preventing. That's right. These are actually hints saying, uh, hints give the hardware, hardware, and the hardware will figure out which are the important bottlenecks. Okay. Yeah, let's take a look at that, actually. So let's take a look at first how do you measure the weight, thread waiting cycle? How does the hardware <coughs> measure thread waiting cycle for each bottleneck? What's the importance of each bottleneck? Let's say small, uh, basically we're going to add a bottleneck table uh, that keeps track of how much waiting each bottleneck has caused. Let's say small core executes one of those bottleneck weight instructions for bottleneck 4500. It sends a signal to the bottleneck table saying, I'm waiting for this bottleneck. And the uh, bottleneck table creates an entry, increases the waiters for that bottleneck ID, and starts with the thread waiting cycles, in, the, in this case, zero. And as this core keeps waiting over cycles, this thread waiting cycle is incremented by the number of waiters. So next cycle, thread waiting cycles becomes two. Next cycle, thread waiting cycles becomes three. Next cycle, next cycle, da da da. And small core two, at some point, let's say, gets a bottleneck wait for the same bottleneck. It sends a message to the bottleneck table saying, oh, I'm waiting for this bottleneck. Bottleneck table basically increments the number of waiters for that bottleneck. Now it's become two. And over time, it's basically increments the thread waiting cycles by the number of waiters every cycle. So now you have thread waiting cycles nine. When this core stops waiting for this bottleneck, it acquires a lot. It sends a message to the bottleneck table saying, I'm no longer waiting for this bottleneck, decrement the waiters. And the bottleneck table decrements the waiters. And later, small core one also acquires the lock. In the meantime, that gets dec incremented, of course. It sends a signal saying, I'm, not, I'm no longer waiting for bottleneck ID 4500, and bottleneck table decrements the waiters. Now you get zero. And after that point, thread waiting cycles doesn't get incremented anymore. That's the idea. So that way, you can associate number of cycles uh, uh, each bottleneck has called waiting to other cores uh, and associate that with the bottleneck IDs. So how do you actually accelerate bottlenecks with the highest thread waiting cycles? Once you have information for these different bottlenecks that are very fine grained, uh, now you have thread waiting cycles associated with each bottleneck. Let's say small core one uh, does a bottleneck call to a bottleneck 4600. It sends a signal to the bottleneck table asking, should I execute it locally or remotely? Bottleneck table takes that bottleneck ID, looks up the thread waiting cycles, and compares that to a threshold. If thread waiting cycles caused by that bottleneck is less than a threshold, in this case, let's assume that it's less, the bottleneck table tells the small core, this is not an important bottleneck. It doesn't cause a lot of thread waiting cycles so far, so execute it locally. And the small core executes it locally. And let's say later on, small core gets a bottleneck called 4700. It asks the bottleneck table, should I execute it remotely or should I execute it locally? And bottleneck table in this case looks up the thread waiting cycles again. In this case, the thread waiting cycle is greater than the threshold, happens to be. The bottleneck table says, oh, this is important. So you should ship it to the large core so that we can get out of this bottleneck very quickly. Right. And the signal is sent to the small core. Small core prepares the packet that we described earlier, very similar to exterior critical sections, sends it to the large core. And large core is a scheduling buffer now that is very similar to critical section request buffer, except it's not a FIFO anymore. We're going to prioritize the bottlenecks in terms of thread waiting cycles in this scheduling buffer. The bottleneck that has higher thread waiting cycles will be executed earlier. And this packet gets sent, it gets queued. We have a program counter, we have a stack pointer, core ID, as well as thread waiting cycles, which is not here. After some point, this bottleneck becomes the bottleneck with the highest thread waiting cycles, and the live core takes it and sends it for execution uh, in its units. And once that's done, a bottleneck return uh, instruction is executed. That's the purpose of the bottleneck return instruction. And that sends a signal to the small core saying, I'm done with the bottleneck. You can continue with whatever code that comes after the bottleneck. And that's how acceleration is achieved. Now, you can say that bottleneck table is actually a global table. And it's a, a structure that can be a bottleneck, a different kind of hardware bottleneck in itself. So to ensure that that's not the case, we cache the entries of the bottleneck table in acceleration index tables and small cores periodically or upon updates. That way, small core can quickly figure out should, it uh, should this bottleneck be executed locally or remotely. OK. So there are two mechanisms that I've already described. There is how to determine thread waiting cycles and how to accelerate bottlenecks. There are actually some mechanisms to improve the performance and generality of this that I will briefly talk about. First of all, dealing with false serialization is important here also. You don't want to falsely serialize bottlenecks, and we have mechanisms for that. Uh, preemptive acceleration, 
I'll briefly talk about and support for multiple large cores. If you have multiple large cores, you would actually like to distribute the bottlenecks to those large cores so that you can take advantage of them. Full serialization, we've already talked about this. this. The problem is very similar. If you have two different bottlenecks that can be executed in parallel, you don't want to serialize them. Then the question is how do you actually figure that out? This can actually be pretty bad in this system if you don't figure this out because we're uh, executing bottlenecks in the thread waiting cycles order. Right? It's not a FIFO order anymore. You can get starvation of bottlenecks. Uh, so the solution is large core detects when a bottleneck is ready to execute in the scheduling buffer, but it cannot. And if, if it cannot, it sends the bottleneck back to the small core. So you need to have mechanisms for this. These are not as complex as the system, but these are the complexities that are needed to be able to do fine grain acceleration uh, in a, uh, uh, in a multi-core system. Preemptive acceleration is actually important. Uh, this is actually an interesting problem. Uh, basically, a bottleneck, you're executing a bottleneck on a small core and can become the most important bottleneck uh, with the highest thread waiting cycles, because you've already entered the bottleneck, right? And if you think about a barrier, it's like that. Uh, if you think about a pipeline state, it's also like that. Basically, bottleneck, this bottleneck should really be accelerated. It should be really be uh, executed on the large core, assuming our hypothesis is true. You have uh, bottlenecks that cause the highest thread waiting are on the critical path. The solution in this case also adds a little bit more complexity. Basically, the bottleneck table detects the situation that the bottleneck should really be accelerated and send a preemption signal to the small core, uh, saying that small core, you're executing a bottleneck that has the highest thread waiting cycles at this point, so pack up your state, save the register state on the stack, and ship the bottleneck to the large core. And I think this is the most general mechanism that you need to do very fine grain acceleration in multi-cores. And I think once you have the support, you can accelerate pretty much uh, anything uh, in a remote uh, execution unit very fast. So this is the main acceleration mechanism for barriers and pipeline stages. And support for multiple large cores, I'll go over this very quickly. Basically, each large core needs to have its own scheduling buffer. And this, this way, you can accelerate independent bottlenecks. You can accelerate independent bottlenecks if you have multi-threading in the large core as well. But now you, have, you run into a trade-off, right? Because if you accelerate two bottlenecks at the same time, uh, they are sharing resources in a multi-threaded engine as well. So you're not accelerating uh, both of them at the same amount. So it's better to have multiple large cores if you can afford it. And bottleneck table in this case assigns each bottleneck to a fixed large core context to preserve cash locality and avoid busy waiting. Okay, what's the hardware cost of all of this? Actually, the, in terms of the storage cost, it's not that costly. These are, the main structure is the bottleneck table, and it could be small. Uh, scheduling buffers, you need to have one, uh, one table per large core, as many entries as small cores and acceleration index table. And they, those could be small also. These are all small structures. They're off the critical path, or you have to design them to be off the critical path. It's not that hard. Uh, and total storage cost for a 64 small core equivalent system is less than 19 kilobytes. More than the storage cost, it's really the complexity of the mechanisms that you need to support. Uh, that will be difficult, I think. But I think if you, uh, if you want to build something like this, uh, we'll need to bite the bullet and actually do it. So there are performance trade-offs that are very similar to accelerated critical sections. I'll not go over these. Uh, these are very, very similar to uh, mm, accelerated critical sections, but basically we'll take a look at them uh, as we go along in the results. And we'll, we'll, we'll get back to the better shared data locality versus worst private data locality trade-off again. Let's take a look at what's the performance improvement. We have similar workloads. Now we add some barrier intensive and pipeline parallel applications as well. And we have a similar simulator with uh, similar parameters as I described earlier. Comparison points, I'm not going to compare to symmetric multi-cores anymore. These are actually not uh, the best. Whether it's small cores or large cores, symmetric multi-cores actually uh, underperform a symmetric multi-core. Uh, AC ACMP is the baseline. Accelerated critical sections is one of the techniques we'll compare to. And feedback with the pipeline, software-based library that a coarse grain migrates uh, pipeline stages to large cores uh, is another uh, comparison point. And these are the workloads that we have. Uh, again, this is the geometric mean over here. This is speed up compared to ACMP now. Basically, serial parts execute on the large core. And blue bar shows a combination of accelerated critical sections and feedback-directed pipelining. We've combined these two works. And this is the red bar. And uh, again, we compare with the optimal number of threads for each workload for each a mechanism so that we're fair. Uh, these are the workloads where ACS actually is applicable to our, uh, and these are the pipeline parallel workloads where ACS doesn't do much over here because uh, it's mainly the pipeline stages without 
uh, other kinds of synchronization. Uh, that's how the workload is configured. So if you look at these workloads, this improves performance significantly. The red bar is much higher than the blue bar. It turns out limiting bottlenecks change over time, and criticality of the bottlenecks is important. There are some bottlenecks uh, that are not that critical, some critical sections that do not cause a lot of contention. And with this, we actually find out those bottlenecks and accelerate them better. Yes? Uh, yeah. 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 And so instead of using create more cores than one large core, do you have numbers using two large cores and then 37 more cores and then three large cores? Yes. Because then within the SD procedures, I'm sure that you would reach the initial reference point. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. So we actually have results. Those are in the paper. Uh, and I'll show you, I think, a couple of res uh, one result over here. As large cores increase, uh, uh, as the number of large cores act increases, you get better performance, but not a whole lot better performance. This is assuming you don't have in enough area budget. So if your area budget is 32, and if you have four large cores, you used up 50% of your area for large cores, assuming one large core is four small cores. Okay. So uh, there are some workloads you have where you have barriers which ACS cannot accelerate. Uh, uh, and you get significant performance improvement over those also. So overall, uh, this outperforms a combination of accelerated critical sections and feedback rate and pipelining by 15% and the baseline ACMP by 32%. And it improves scalability for four benchmarks also. Yes? Have you looked at uh, how much uh, critical section time you need with a synthetic benchmark or something like if you have 15% executing a parallel section, uh, how much time do you need to uh, how, mu how much execution should happen in the yeah. critical section? Uh, so it's it's not clear if it's the execution in the critical section. It's more like is the critical section on the critical path? Yeah, so and l let me show you a result. That <laughs> so why does it work basically? Uh, let's uh, so uh, we we try to identify uh, what if what is being accelerated is on the critical path. It's actually a tough task to do because you were changing what is being accelerated dynamically, right? And the critical path changes dynamically. But we do an offline analysis over here that tries to figure out what fraction of the code that we accelerate is actually on the critical path. And what, what I show over here is the execution time of the entire workload. And this is a fraction of execution time that's spent on predicted important bottlenecks, which means that this is a fraction of execution time where the large core is actually busy executing something. So if you look at the blue bar in the, in the baseline mechanism, ACS and FTP, uh, the large core is executing something about 55% of the time. We actually increase that because we cover more bottlenecks, more synchronization constructs. So the large core is busy 80% of the time. But is it executing the thing that's really important to execute, which is, is the thing that's, that it's executing on the critical path of execution? Ideally, if you improve the critical path of execution, you would improve performance, right? That's the definition of a critical path. So the fraction that's actually critical is denoted in green here. And take this with a grain of salt because it's very hard to do this experiment. It's an offline experiment. Uh, online, if you know how to do it efficiently, I'd love to talk to you. <laughs> uh, but basically, if you look at this with a baseline mechanism, accelerated critical sections that feedback rate with pipelining, uh, its coverage is a fraction of program critical path that's actually identified as bottlenecks. And the coverage over here is about 39%. Whereas this improves that to 59%. So the green, the height of the green bar over here is 59% of the program execution time. So we cover basically 59% of the program critical path. So we get better coverage. If you define accuracy if the, as the identified bottlenecks that are on the critical path over total identified bottlenecks or predicted important bottlenecks, the accuracy of identification is 72% with ACS and FTP and 74% with BIS. So why is this important? I think coverage is a lot more important. If you can cover the entire program critical path, you can, at any point in time, you can, you'll be executing the critical path on the large core, right? And ideally, that's a goal. This shows that we're doing better, but we're not doing great. So there's a lot more potential. Uh, and ideally, you would like to get the results. What if you uh, improve the performance of the critical path perfectly, right? What would you, your performance be? And that's very tough to do also. So that ideal result is hard to get. That's why I cannot tell you that. So what's the importance of accuracy? The importance of accuracy is you would like to accelerate only the critical path and nothing else right? Uh, to save efficiency. Again, this is barring effects of shared data locality. If you put in shared data locality, uh, perhaps you, you take a look at something else in terms of performance. But basically, in terms of accuracy, 
uh, the accuracy is reasonably well. I think. But basically, I hope I hope this answers your question. This basically looks at what fraction of the uh, critical path we actually uh, cover. And going forward, I think identifying the critical path and multi-threaded applications is a very interesting direction. Okay, there are a bunch of scaling results in the paper. Uh, I won't necessarily cover them, but performance actually increases as you increase more small uh, the number of small cores. And because this is because contention increases and loss of parallel throughput due to large core reduces. You can look at that. This was one of the questions that came up. As you add more large cores, what happens to performance? <laughs> and you get some performance benefit, as you see. It's not that great. And this is the benefit you get by accelerating independent bottlenecks. And this is with 64 equal of course. Okay. Any questions? Otherwise, I'll summarize this. Yes? The performance benefits are also coming from the shared data hypercache. That's right, yes. So actually, uh, that's an interesting question. With X-ray, the critical sections, we were shipping everything to the large core, so we were getting perfect shared data benefits. With right now, we're being more diligent about what to ship to the large core, so we're losing on some of the shared data locality benefits. The interesting thing is, if you identify what's on the critical path, maybe that's okay. Because what happens is, what you're executing on the small core is probably more tolerant to latency. So you'll probably be okay keeping that, keeping that, uh, keeping the shared data locality low for that portion of the program. But we don't have a perfect identification, so we're losing on some of the benefits of keeping shared data in the large core. And second question is uh, regarding this: uh, in the setup you're using, you're using exactly more or less the same hierarchy <coughs> for the large core and the small cores. Mm -hmm. But the, the final goal, what you're trying to do, is to execute very specific code, which, is, which are critical sections of the large core. So have you explored changing or modifying the cache hierarchy? To accommodate to this kind of special characteristics of the code? Or so, not, not significant. No, we have not, that's something we have not explored, but I think that's a good research direction as well. You can try to customize the core as well as the cache hierarchy for that purpose. But there's only one thing I'll describe, which is uh, fixing the private data locality. Okay. That's the only thing we've considered. Yes? I'm guessing it's uh, some exception to the cache Oh, uh, I don't have it with me right now, but uh, we have looked at examples of barriers, for example. Uh, some of these are barrier intensive applications, and barrier is a potential bottleneck. And if one thread is uh, arriving late at the barrier, uh, that becomes uh, a critical bottleneck that gets accelerated. So I don't have examples for all workloads, but for some workloads I have them. We can talk about that. Uh, afterwards. Yes? If there was the cache hierarchy you are using in these configurations, do you have like uh, N2 types or you have a global shared cache? Or yes, there is a global shared cache that's L3. I believe it's L1, L2, L3. Three levels. L1, L1 private, L2, L2 private, and L3 shared across the course. Okay. Okay. Uh, basically, what we talked about is serializing bottlenecks. And these are of different types. They limit performance of multi-thread applications, and their importance changes over time at a very fine grain. This is a hardware software cooperative solution that dynamically identifies bottlenecks that cause the most thread weighting and accelerates them on large cores of an ACMP. It's applicable to critical sections, barriers, and pipeline stages, and it improves performance uh, and scalability of parallel applications. Uh, and performance benefits increase with uh, more cores. So I believe this provides comprehensive fine-grained uh, bottleneck installation for future ACMPs, hopefully with little or no programmer effort. Although if the programmer wants to take advantage of it, they can, they can program it uh, with the uh, instructions that are exposed to them. I think going forward, uh, so this, uh, this was our assumption, right? The, the code that caused the most thread weighting uh, leads to uh, the critical path. Looking into other ways of predicting the critical, critical path is a very interesting research direction. And I don't think we do a great job at that at this point. Okay, so let's take a look at a problem that's actually present whenever you ship 
Whenever you ship uh, uh, data to uh, co uh, compute the data, yes. Okay, so uh, before you move on to that, sure. uh, which I do want to hear about, um, for your experiments, did you go and actually modify the code and, um, manually to start to bottleneck weights and bottleneck star uh, instructions? So uh, for for some cases, yes. Usually, if the program is programmed with libraries, then we use the library code and. Uh, and did it manually. We don't, we don't have a compiler class that actually does that. Right, so you do the modifications in the library. In other words, you take, you know, if they call future text lock, slot, then you go and you put in your instructions. That's right. That's and that's totally reasonable and fine. Huh? But did you actually have to go into the code of the programs themselves, not the libraries? Oh, no, we, we didn't go into the code of the programs. Okay. Yes. We, we, uh, if, yeah, we didn't try to figure out what's a critical section and what's not a critical section. But we didn't have to change anything in the code. Okay. And so, uh, did you actually implement any compiler modifications? No, no compiler modifications. Okay. That, that would have taken a much longer time if we actually had to do, right. do that. So, so what do you do with the, all these applications that have their own custom uh, synchronization operations? They, they do, I mean, it's a, a huge problem that these things don't actually use external libraries often, right? They have their own spin locks and their own yeah. variables. And all so that. some of them, I think, if, if they look like a library, we did actually go ahead and modify those. So I, but I, I consider that a library also. If you actually have a library within an application right. okay. that consistently uses that uh, that portal, if you will, that gate to actually implement synchronization operations, we did actually modify those. Okay. And uh, I, I believe that uh, then uh, the application writer can incorporate the mechanisms over here. Right. But if you actually have very irregular, I think if you're talking about more irregular ways of doing synchronization, uh, rather than having a nice like mini library, in the interface, yeah. right. that's I don't I don't know what you can do about that. That you can uh, that the programmer if, if they go into the uh, pain of doing that, they can probably figure out uh, oh let me actually sorry this uh, let me actually call the bottom also. Right. That's the hope. Yes. And how uh, how is the uh, variance of of these critical. Uh, bottlenecks that you observe, is it fairly uh, um, constant over the execution or, or the, the criticality changes? Oh, okay. of, 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 mm -hmm. So you can do the reverse maybe, that, that if, if it stays pretty much the a given section is always critical, maybe you can, this could be a good feedback for mm -hmm. the program. That's right, so potentially, yes, we, did, uh, we saw that some bottlenecks very, we did do extensive analysis on that. Uh, but uh, we saw that some bottlenecks criticality varies quite a bit, as I showed you uh, in my SQL. But some bottlenecks can be constant also. And I think this could be used as a feedback mechanism too. We didn't try to do that, but uh, having a report that shows what are the thread waiting cycles for these different bottlenecks could be useful for programmers' purposes. But I agree. I think going forward, looking at these coarse grain bottlenecks and maybe uh, giving feedback could be useful. Okay. Okay. So let's take a look at uh, one problem that exists whenever you ship compute the uh, data. And I'm going to be very abstract. I'll call something the stage execution model. Our goal is really, if you take a step back, we're going we're speeding up a program by dividing up it, uh, it up into pieces. And the idea is to split a program code into segments and run each segment on the core that's best suited to run it. And you can each uh, in a stage execution model, you can think of each core to be assigned a work queue storing segments to be run. And that's what we're doing with x area critical sections. Uh, the benefits of this, but this is a much more general model. The benefits of this is you can exploit segments or critical paths using specialized heterogeneous cores. You can exploit inter-segment parallelism. And you can hopefully improve locality of within segment data if you partition your code well, such that uh, different segments, a segment, uh, this, uh, the same segments operate on the same data, you can actually get much better data locality. And there are many examples of this. We've covered x critical sections, bottleneck identification and scheduling, producer-consumer pipeline parallelism. A lot of task parallelism models uh, can be thought of this way as a stage execution, uh, if you stretch a little bit. And special purpose cores and function links can be thought of this way as well. So basically, at a very abstract level, what we're doing is we're taking a program and splitting it into segments, segment 0, 1, 2. And we're assigning instances of those segments to different cores. And uh, some cores may have instances of uh, the same segments, uh, different segments, as well as the same segment can be partitioned across different cores. That's not the problem we're going to target. Somebody does these assignments of the segments to the work queues. 
But whenever you have a model like this, segments are spawned, right? And in one particular model, one example, segment zero is running on core zero, it spawns segment one, runs on core one, and that spawns segment two, runs on core two. This looks like a pipeline parallel model a little bit. Right? Uh, let's take a look at two examples. Let's say the critical sections we've already covered. Uh, basically, segment zero can be thought of as a non-critical section, and segment one can be thought of as a critical section. Right? And you all know the benefits of this. Producer-consumer pipeline parallelism. Here, the idea is to split a loop iteration into multiple pipeline stages, where one stage consumes data uh, produced by the next stage. Uh, and each stage runs on a different core. You can think of segment n as stage n in this case. right? And the benefits uh, uh, we already discussed. You get stage level parallelism, and if you partition your code well, you get better lookout. The problem with all of these models is whenever you need to communicate between these two segments, your locality is not good. Why? Because when core one needs to load this data that's actually written by segment zero, uh, which is executing on core zero, you get a cache miss. And that cache miss is likely on the critical path, right? Because you need, to, you need that data to continue. So you need to transfer Y. Similarly, when segment two needs low, uh, the C, it gets a cache miss because it's produced by the previous segments. So we're going to target this problem. In Excel critical sections, basically critical section incurs a cache miss when it touches data produced in the non-critical section. This is what we call the thread private data earlier, right? In producer-consumer pipeline realm, a stage incurs a cache miss when it touches data produced by the previous stage. Right? And performance of stage execution is actually limited by these intersegment cache misses. And I'll show you some data. What if we ideally eliminate these cache misses? In accelerated critical sections with 32 cores, uh, if you ideally eliminate intersegment cache misses, when one segment requires the data produced by a previous segment, and you make that magically a cache miss in the simulator, you get 10% performance improvement, approximately. With stage in pipeline parallelism, you get even more, about 21%. And these may not look like uh, very large numbers, but I'm going to show you mechanisms that get most of that benefit. And also, these numbers increase as you increase the number of cores going forward into the future. So uh, we'll target this problem. Well, I'm going to introduce a mechanism called data marshaling. Let me first introduce some terminology. Uh, I'll define as intersegment data a cache block that's written by one segment and consumed by the next segment. So in this case, Y is intersegment data, basically the cache block that contains Y, uh, and also Z. And I'll define as generator instruction the as the last instruction to write to an intersegment cache block, basically the last instruction to produce that intersegment data <laughs> in a segment. In this case, the store Y, the second store Y, is a generator instruction. And store Z is a generated instruction also. So the key observation here is that the set of generated instructions is stable over execution time and across input sets. That's what we will observe. And the idea, once you have made this observation, is to somehow identify these generated instructions. And we're going to do this at, as part of the compiler. But you can actually do this in hardware as well, uh, with, if you want to bear some more hardware costs. Uh, and the hardware records the cache blocks produced by the generated instructions and proactively sends such cache blocks to the next segment's core before initiating the next segment. And this is uh, work done by Alter Suleiman, it's published in ISCA uh, 2010. And let me go over briefly what's needed for the support the compiler and the profiler. And the hardware potentially can actually overcome these. So you can actually purely implement this in the hardware, I believe. Uh, it, uh, they identify generated instructions and insert marshal instructions. So uh, in, at the end, you get a binary containing uh, these markings of the generator instructions as well as instructions that provides hints to the hardware saying you should marshal the data at this point. And the hardware using these records the generator produced addresses and marshals the record blocks to the next core. Let's first take a look at the compiler support. I'll briefly go over that. This is actually relatively simple. You run the program as a single threaded version, and you basically figure out what are the intersegment data and what are the data that's produced, uh, what are the producers of that data. So there's a load that happens, and you know in which segments that load, uh, 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 that block was written to. Right? So the basic compiler marks that instruction as a generator instruction. And because this is based on profiling, you may miss some instructions, and you can be overly uh, aggressive as well, or conservative, depending on the way you look at it. Uh, 
And also the, the compiling instruments are martial instructions. Basically, martial instructions are instructions that tell the hardware when to send the data to the next core and where to send it. And this where to send it needs to be a virtual uh, core, right? Because we do not know the physical mapping at that point in time. So there, there needs to be some somebody hardware that needs to do that binding, the virtual core address to the physical core address that the next segment gets mapped to. And we're going to assume that support. Uh, basically, this is the support that's needed. Uh, you need generator instructions and Marshall instructions to be identified. The IC needs to support them, of course. And the library and the hardware bind the next segment ID to a physical core. The hardware needs to have a, uh, have a Marshall buffer, which stores physical address of cache blocks to be Marshalls. And in our workload, 16 is are large enough not for all workloads, I'll show you some data. It needs to have the ability to execute new instructions, obviously. It needs to have the ability to push data to another cache, which doesn't exist in many uh, systems today. But you can actually, you need to actually modify the coherence protocol to ensure that this works correctly. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of this before I go into the results? So it turns out we get timely data transfer because we can push the data to core before it's needed. Uh, you can marshal any arbitrary sequence of line. We're, we're trying to not identify uh, uh, the patterns. Actually, patterns don't seem to exist for this kind of data. And if they exist, it's very hard to train a prefetcher very quickly because there are only few cache lines that you marshal. So prefetchers don't work very well here. Uh, basically, we identify generators, not patterns, and the hardware cost is actually low because we use extensive profiling for this. The hardware doesn't need to find the generators. Although I believe uh, we have some hardware mechanisms. The hardware, it's, it's not that difficult for the hardware to find it. You can piggyback on the coherence protocol to figure out what's a generator instruction. As long as you know the boundaries of these segments. Yes? Uh, do we need these instructions? Why don't you So the problem is that, that that's pulling the data. Now we're pushing the data. If you, if you need to start executing on the large core, it's too late. Here, we're pushing the data proactively before the data, uh, code even execute, starts executing on the large core. If you wait until you do almost do the load, it's too late. So any kind of prefetching you do in the core that's uh, receiving the computation is too late. That's what we found. So this advances the obvious requires profile and IC support. I believe you can eliminate this. Uh, it's not always accurate. Generator set is conservative or aggressive, depending on how you look at it. Basically, in the profiling run, whenever uh, we see a generator, we mark it as a generator. Uh, and this, uh, if, if you're, if you do, uh, if you send the data, even if it's not going to be, even if it's not going to be used, you get you cause pollution in the remote core, and you, it wastes the bandwidth on the interconnect. But this turns out to be another large problem as the number of intersegment blocks is actually small, as I'll show you. So let's take a look at how this works pictorially. This actually had critical sections. Remember, we have the small core and the large core. And we're executing the non-critical section in the small core. We're going to add a Marshall buffer to the small core's cache. And when the small core executes this generated instruction, any generated instruction, it basically records the address that's generated. And then when the small core gets to uh, this critical section call, it takes it as an implicit Marshall instruction. We're going to send this critical section call uh, to the large core. So we're going to send the data also. Basically, the hardware over here, the control logic, takes every address that's recorded in the Marshall buffer, accesses the cache, generates a packet with the address and the data, and pushes it to the large core's cache. And large core has to have the support to receive it without any coherence issues. And when hopefully the large score starts executing the critical section, when it gets to load Y, the hope is that it gets a cache hit instead of a cache miss. And if it's not a cache hit, hopefully most of the transfer overhead is covered. Okay, so what is the benefit of this? This is the same, uh, uh, same infrastructure. Basically, this is a speed up over extended critical sections for the workloads that I showed you before. The red bar shows that speed up. We get 8.7% performance benefit with a 32 core system. And this is uh, compared, uh, the blue bar shows the ideal. What if you ideally eliminate these cache misses? So you get very close to what you can ideally do. And with pipeline parallelism, it's basically the same thing. Now you have Marshall buffers in all of the cores. And now you actually need the explicit Marshall instructions. Basically, uh, when the core zero executes segment zero, the generator instructions 
the address are recorded in the Marshall buffer. And when a Marshall instruction is encountered, uh, the core, uh, the logic actually goes through this Marshall buffer and marshals every address and data packet to the destination core. And there needs to be binding of that address to a physical core address. And hopefully once, once the next segment executes on core one, it again gets a cache. Right. That's the hope, yes. In the marshalling, why do you use core identifier instead of segment identifier? So you could do so it. So you are. Yeah, as long as you have that mapping, I think you could do it that way also. As long as you have that, you, as long as you can, uh, you can map where the receiving segment is executing physically. Whatever you use over here doesn't matter that much. Have yes. you considered uh, annotated instructions so you can marshal to different cores? So that's a yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. that's, a, that's a good question. We have not considered that, but there are actually programs where you need the data in different cores also. And right now, we are not covering those cases. Yes. I think you need additional steps to update the directory in the or, or So when you actually send the data, yes, that's right. But other than that, right, uh, other than supporting the pushing of the data to a cache that's not expecting any data, Supporting that in the coherence protocol. Other than that, you don't need anything else. Sure, sure. That's right. That's right. Because, uh, well, if you have a directory based protocol, yes, you need it. The directory somehow needs to know that uh, it's basically uh, this cache now has that data. That's what I meant, right? That's <coughs> and I think going, uh, so it's interesting <coughs> that existing systems don't have the support. Uh, that pushing support. And I think it enables a lot of different things if you expose something like that to the software too. Yes? So have you considered the possibility that obviously this doesn't scale up uh, in general, but I mean, uh, you know, in a lot of cases you have these multi-core systems, right? You have shared small caches between the cores, right? So, you know, if I were architecting one of these things, I would put the stages next to each other and mm -hmm. be able to hide it up 50% of the latency, let's say, if every pair of them shares a core or shares a path. Right. So the, 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 the stage that communicate. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Uh -huh. exactly. Right. So I mean that that buys you that takes you half of the way to your ideal uh, sort of for free on conventional mm -hmm. hardware. Right. Yeah. So I, I agree. I think that that mapping uh, people should do that mapping also. Right. Yes. People actually built specialized customized hardware for pipeline parallel programs. They've actually built queues and exposed those queues. Sure. Sure. And we're trying to not to do that. We're basically trying to do that in a shared memory model. But I, I agree. All of these mappings. They should be done. If you can get rid of this problem, it's better to get rid of this problem. Yes? Does MyVM have something similar to that concept, uh, something they did for MPI for pushing data which is connected to API directly into the MyVM system? Oh, that, that I was not aware of, and a shared memory model. Is, is yeah. it inside the node for data that goes between the link and memory? Yeah. It's not only between the link and memory, but also push. Okay, uh, so uh, yeah, I, I don't know, and you have you still have cash for hands. Okay, I'd be uh, I'd be interested in finding out that particular processor. I know they have something like that. Yeah. I don't think it's easy to support. I don't think it's that hard to support, but I don't know of any <laughs> general purpose processor that has. Their motivation was for MPI, for supporting MPI. Yeah, it makes sense. It's a different thing, but. No, ex exactly. Basically, what we're, if you think about it, this is also adding some sort of message passing into the shared memory model, right? That's, that's what we're trying to do also. Okay, so what is the performance benefit of this on pipeline parallel applications? These are the workloads. In this case, we have a symmetric multi-core because we have, uh, we're just evaluating pipeline parallelism uh, as it is. Uh, if you look at this, again, these are the pipeline parallel applications. This is speed up over uh, baseline. Uh, which is a symmetric multi-core. Data marshalling improves performance by 16%, and the ideal is about 21%. So here, we're not that close to the ideal, but it turns out in some of these benchmarks, there's a lot of data that needs to be pushed. So a 16-entry marshal buffer doesn't provide you enough uh, storage. So you lose some of the data that you really want to push. And the paper has analysis on the, how, how large of a marshal buffer you need for some of these different applications. So why does this work? Uh, this is... Uh, uh, basically, we looked at the coverage, accuracy, and timeliness uh, of this push-based, I guess it's not prefetcher, but it's like a 
pusher, right? It's a push based prefetch algorithm. And this is data for XA, <coughs> data for pipeline parallelism. This is the coverage of uh, misses. Basically, you cover uh, almost all of these intersegment cache misses with X ray uh, critical sections. And we do not cover all of them. That's why we don't achieve the uh, performance of the ideal uh, in the pipeline parallelism case. The accuracy is relatively low because we're conservative or aggressive in profiling. Basically, we mark everything uh, that produces data for the next segment in the profiling run as a generator instruction. But in a real run, it may not be a generator because there may be an if-else statement, right, that actually executes something else. Uh, and timeless is reasonably uh, high also. These are the fraction of uh, useful uh, prefetches uh, uh, that are actually found in the cache uh, when, when they're needed. So it's actually relatively high because what we're doing is we're overlapping the shipping of the computation where, with the overlapping the shipping of the data, uh, with, with the shipping of the data. And medium accuracy doesn't impact performance because there are very few cache blocks that are marshaled for the average segments. Five for this case, about 6.8 for this case. So uh, some scaling results. Uh, the performance improvement of this is actually increased with the three trends that you see in systems. As you add more cores, as you add higher interconnect latency, uh, and as you have larger private L2 caches. These are all trends that we have in systems. And I don't think these are going to change significantly going forward. Why? Because intersegment data has actually become a larger bottleneck. Uh, well, as you add more cores, you get more communication between the cores. Uh, as you have higher interconnect latency, you get longer stalls due to communication. And if, even if you have larger L3 caches, this doesn't matter because communication misses actually remain. These are the communication misses, and they're not necessarily misses lead to locality. Actually, they become a larger fraction uh, of the misses as you increase the size of your L2 cache. Okay. There are other applications of this, I think. These can be, uh, data marshaling can be applied uh, to other state execution models. It's a general mechanism for identifying what should be shipped uh, with the computation. Uh, and we haven't looked at it, but I think it's uh, interesting to look at this. There are some academic proposals also that, for example, split system level code and user level code. And when you need to communicate between them, you can actually do data marshaling. Uh, and hopefully this can be an enabler for more aggressive state execution models because it lowers the cost of data migration. And I believe increasingly this is going to become an in uh, increasingly more important overhead in remote execution of programs. There's already a huge overhead in something like CPU, GPU systems, right? You have the, uh, and it's, it's, a, it's an unreasonably huge overhead today, I think. Uh, but if you want to do even more finer grained execution, finer grained parallelization, multi-course, uh, you would like to have a mechanism that can communicate the data much faster as well. Yes? How do you consider moving the marshalling instruction up so you know in advance which is the correlating data as the classic listening data? I think that's a great thing to do. We didn't do that that much. So you could, where do you place this marshall instruction? Uh, so in our case, it didn't matter that much because we were timely enough. But in cases where you're not timely, uh, maybe in some of these other models, that might be uh, that may be more, even more important to do. But basically, we pick the point where the last generator was identified and put it over there. But you can do much better, perhaps. You can have mar multiple marshal instructions depending on uh, what program path you take. Right? Okay. Yes. Oh, we have. We're almost done. Okay. So I'm I'm going to summarize this and I'm going to be done. As I as I expected, we didn't get a chance to cover the other part, but that's going to be on Friday. So we've talked about intersegment data transfers between cores. Uh, these limit the benefit of uh, promising state execution models. And data marshaling is a hardware software cooperative solution. Uh, it detects intersegment data and, uh, well, intersegment data generator instructions uh, through the compiler. But as I said, you could do it in hardware as well. And pushes that data to the next segment's core before the next segment is initiated. It significantly reduces cache misses for intersegment data. It's low cost high coverage and timely for arbitrary address sequences, and that's, I think, the most important part. It can uh, do this for arbitrary address sequences, and achieves most of the potential of eliminating such misses. It's applicable to several existing state execution models, and I think going forward, it can hopefully enable new models where the migration of this data uh, constitutes a big uh, cost. And this happens in very fine-grained remote execution uh, mechanisms. Let's see. So if time permits, that if condition doesn't hold, so we're going to nullify this predicate instruction here. 
but I can take questions or I can jump to conclusions. Let me conclude and then I'll take questions. There you go. So basically you could apply the principles of asymmetry to memory scheduling also. And if you would like to learn more about that, hopefully uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to cover that in the three to four hour session on Friday. But let me conclude, <laughs> let me summarize uh, what we've talked about. So uh, if you uh, go back up the stack a little bit, applications and phases have varying performance requirements and designs are actually evaluated on multiple metrics, right? Some, you, you don't want to optimize for a single metric anymore. It could be energy, performance, reliability, fairness. You would like to optimize for everything at the same time. One size fits all design. Symmetric design cannot satisfy all the requirements and all the metrics at the same time. Basically, you cannot get the best of all worlds. Or you cannot approximate the best of all worlds. Asymmetry in design, on the other hand, enables trade-offs. Now you can hopefully approximate the best of all worlds. Uh, we've talked about asymmetry in core microarchitecture, <coughs> large cores, small cores. Uh, and we talked about two things, two things, excited critical sections and BIS, bottleneck identification and scheduling that takes advantage of that. Using those, you can get good parallel performance at the same time with good serialized performance whenever you have serializing bottlenecks. And data marshaling is an approach that helps those systems where you communicate data by uh, partitioning, uh, uh, by shipping computation to different places. Uh, you can't take advantage of asymmetry while doing that. We have not talked about asymmetry in memory scheduling, but basically the idea that we didn't talk about and uh, is thread cluster memory scheduling. And this is very interesting, actually. Let's do this. So now you'll see that uh, arrow up here, I think. There you go. Magic with PowerPoint. This arrow wasn't there, right? I wasn't imagining things. But PowerPoint has these bugs where things randomly disappear. That's, this is like memory errors, right? Randomly you get bit flips. I don't, I don't know how these bugs appear in software, but somehow they appear. I don't believe these are memory errors, though. <laughs> that, that's for sure. But anyway, it, it appeared. So if you actually incorporate asymmetry in memory scheduling, uh, you can get good performance system throughput as well as fairness at the same time. If you do not have asymmetry in memory scheduling, it's very difficult to get both of them at the same time. You can get high throughput or high fairness, but not both at the same time. And we'll talk about that on uh, Friday. So I believe simple asymmetric designs can be effective and low cost, but we'll need to figure out how to get there uh, with some key ideas. I think that's all I have. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks for listening for two hours. Thank you. Everything? Yes. So, can you go back to the result you used before? The result of one large core and two large cores. Oh, uh, the. Uh, the yes. Uh, Let me find it. Remember, these are all summary results, also. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's this one, right? Oh, oh did okay. That's better. Yeah. So that's exactly what I hear. Mean. My point is that when you use three large cores, it looks like your technique doesn't improve much the data mining, right? So you go back then, you use BIS, and you your it's like the same. So you, you get so you get the forty percent or you get thirty percent of speed up. So uh -huh. like if you increase the number of, of large cores then all techniques are the same. No? Or well there's still a significant difference. I, I don't know why this one improves a lot more actually. This is something, a good question for Jose, probably. Jose Joao. But uh, my feeling and my hypothesis that they, uh, based on discussions uh, is here we're identifying what's critical in a much more efficient manner with BIS. Whereas these, app, these uh, ACS, for example, it ships all of the critical sections, right? So it's inefficient. It's making up for that inefficiency by having more large cores. Whereas identifying what is the critical bottleneck doesn't require that many large cores. That's my uh, hypothesis. That's why it's getting a lot better performance. But it's coming at the cost of inefficiency, I think. Yeah, you know, I, 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 
And this actually, remember, there, there, there's a caveat to this study also. This actually using area equal to 64 small cars. If you not have that budget, so basically you're, we're spending 12 uh, small car area for large cars, which is not that bad with a 64 core system. If this was actually 32, uh, what we see is as you go to three small, three large cores, you don't get performance but you actually get a degradation. Mm -hmm. yeah. It looks like it's like an optimal condition problem. You have an area and you have to split this area in an optimal way to get the performance. Right? Something like that. Yes, I agree. And I think that's a separate problem. We do not tackle that problem. Like how many cores should you dedicate uh, to be large cores? And that's uh, that's a problem that should be tackled also. Yes. Uh, again, the question for me about the identification of the regions here, I mean, because you mentioned the barriers, and mm -hmm. that's something I don't understand. I, mean, I think, I mean, the near barrier or the NPI, it, it is they are perfect. It doesn't, it's not interesting to detect the barrier. It's uh, the barrier is a perfect gas. It fills whatever space you, you give it. The problem is not in the barrier, the problem is in what was before the barrier. Okay, so yes, I think I think uh, I think we're on the same page. Let me just go here. I think I understand your question now. So if you look at a barrier, this is what we do. Basically, uh, you uh, you execute some. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> How did this happen? Okay, I'm going to fix this problem also. There you go. <laughs> Magic. That's a very different kind of air. I have not seen that before. <laughs> now we can try to figure out how that error happened, but uh, let's, uh, let me answer your question first. But basically, this is the code that's running for the barrier. Right? Every thread is running this. And once it reaches the barrier, it does bottleneck return. And basically, at that point, it enters the barrier and waits for all threads to reach the barrier. This is where the waiting happens. So basically, all threads run. And some of them reach, uh, enter the barrier earlier. And when they're, uh, when they've entered the barrier, they're waiting, right? They're waiting for other threads, which means that you're incrementing this bottleneck ID. This barrier that's being executed by some other thread is becoming an important thing because it's causing waiting. Now, when all threads arrive at the barrier, everybody exits the barrier, right, in this case. So what happens in this case is if a thread reaches the barrier, Early, it starts causing, uh, it starts basically incrementing the bottleneck uh, waits, thread waiting cycles. And if there's a, let's say, the last thread, uh, it has not reached the barrier. Every other thread has reached the barrier. They've incremented the thread waiting cycles, and this last thread is lagging. Bottleneck table detects that situation, says that oh, thread waiting cycle so for this bottleneck ID is very high, and it knows which threads are actually executing the bottlenecks because they've executed the bottleneck calls. You execute the bottleneck call, you start running for the barrier, and you do not return until you finish the code that reaches the barrier. And the bottleneck table says, oh, I know these threads are executing this uh, bottleneck ID, so I'm going to tell these threads, tell these cores that are executing those threads, ship their bottlenecks to the large core. And we do that for one uh, or multiple threads, depending on how many large cores we can have. Is this more clear? This one? No, the shifting. So everybody has already started running for the barrier. So everybody, there are several of them waiting. So you say the ones are still inside are now urgent. Yes, exactly, exactly. If you move, this is where you the identification. If you move the ones that are still running for the exactly, barrier. exactly. We move the ones that are still running for it. You can do much better, I think, because we're we're not predictive in this case, right? We know. Uh, once, once some number of uh, waiting cycles has been caused by threads that have already reached the barrier, uh, uh, we do that. But you can actually try to figure this out earlier. I don't know how to do that yet, but that's clear, right? So there, there's more room for optimization here, basically.
too early for lunch in Barcelona, right? <laughs> so you can still ask questions. <laughs> Not really? <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're an early riser, maybe. <laughs> okay, well, thanks a lot. Thank you.